Welcome to the August meeting of AHSA Queensland. Um, I know you folk at home have all been chatting away on your Zooms and uh, a good time there. Um, just going to mention that Cursey uh, Group Captain David Fredericks, Director of the Director of History, History and Heritage Services, History and Heritage, Air Force, known to us as Fredo. Uh, he's given us some copies of some books put out by the History and Heritage Division. And uh, I'll be taking, going to a raffle with the people who come to our meeting in person. It's good to come to the meeting in person. You can chat with other people and you might even get special goodies at time to time. I know a lot of you are seeing our service from your Zooms and that's all good too, if you can't get the nice to have people in the room. Uh, and I'll do that draw after the recording. Um, welcome to local members here. And just a couple of things happening around. Reminder that uh, in October, end of October, last weekend of October, there'll be an air tattoo at RAF Amberley. I uh, hope you got your tickets before they sold out, which went so quickly. There's uh, initial information getting around now about a three-day Pacific air show. It's going to be on at Surface Paradise on the Gold Coast in about a year from now, 18th to the 20th of August 2023. Tickets for that are going to go on sale late this year. I've not a clue of how they're going to charge for it and what you have, where you're going to be on the Gold Coast to see it, but we'll hear about it, no doubt. Um, just uh, our next speakers for the next couple of months, uh, next month, Ray Villeman will be talking about flying TAA DC-3s in Papua New Guinea. And in October, Daryl Dynock, or Dimmock, about two restless spirits, Harry Hawker and Bert Hinkler. They both had uh, very similar careers from before World War I until after it. Um, but now our guest speaker coming to us from Victoria by Zoom is Mark Pilkington, who will be doing his presentation from Victoria about the CAC Wacket and the Yeoman Cropmaster. After chatting with Mark a couple of weeks ago, I realised that he is an expert in all things CAC Wacket trainers. Mark, I'll hand over, you have the electronic floor. Thanks very much, uh, Warwick and everyone uh, uh, for this opportunity. I'd like to thank uh, Peter, particularly Peter approached me, I think it was uh, in January or February, looking for a, uh, uh, a backup speaker for one of the HSA Queensland speakers, I think in February or March, who may not have been able to deliver. And uh, I said I could do a whack at presentation fairly quickly. It's been deferred to August and that's given me a lot of time to do a lot of research. And I'd like to thank uh, various people, including Joe Vella for, for that assistance in putting that uh, uh, research together. So if I can go with no further ado uh, to my presentation. So I'm giving a presentation on the uh, CAC Wacker Trainer and the Yeoman Cropmaster. There's a lot of slides in this pack. I'm not going to read off word for word every word on the slides, but because this is being recorded, I've put the detail there so people wanting to step through the recording at a later stage could pause and read the detail. So please bear with me with the number of slides I'm gonna try and present. I'd like to thank the various people listed here and I won't go through their names, but I've mentioned Peter and Joe, my brother, David, uh, and people who've provided me photos and my references uh, below in that section below. The Wacker trainers, uh, perhaps a, a poorly remembered type in Australia, but it's a very important type nonetheless. First in-house design of CAC, the eighth and most successful design of Lawrence Wackett, first local designed aircraft to enter mass production and a number of other credentials that I'll present uh, on as we step through the presentation. Uh, just briefly on Sir Lawrence Wackett, and I again won't read everything here, he's a Queenslander. He joined the army, graduated from Duntroon, joined one squadron AFC, he's one of 12 pilots that went to Egypt. He mounted a Lewis gun on the top wing of his BE-2C, he went to three squadron uh, in France. He designed a parachute and bomb rank to uh, be able to drop supplies to troops. He was promoted to a major and pointed to the CO of, oh, I'm sorry here, but it's number three squadron, number seven, not number seven as I've reported. Here he is at Point Cook in 1915, Dickie Williams sitting in the BE-2A and uh, 
Sir Lawrence standing next to him and on the right, a very youthful looking Sir Lawrence in his uh, uh, 1915 uh, international pilot's license. And here he is standing to the right. And this is his BE2 with the gun mounted on the top. There's many other innovations that he developed during World War I that I won't go into, but we know him as a, a designer and a administrator of uh, the aviation industry, but he played a significant role in World War I that's perhaps also not told well today. Um, he was one of 21 officers who graduated from the AFC to the RAF in 1921. He went on to do a Bachelor of Science at Melbourne Uni, and he studied for two years uh, under uh, Frank Barnwell in aircraft design. And Frank Barnwell was a, a Bristol uh, designer. He designed the Bristol Scout. Uh, he designed the Bristol uh, Brisket F2B fighter and later the Bristol Bulldog, so a very experienced designer. So Lawrence then designed his first aircraft, uh, the Wackett Warbler uh, with his own uh, designed engine. The RAF then set up an experimental aircraft section and he designed the Widgeon flying boat and later the uh, amphibian, and then uh, designed uh, two versions of a two seat biplane trainer, the Warrigal. He then joined Tugan, uh, and Tugan was taken over by CAC and he became the general manager. Three of his uh, first designs a Wackett Wobbler of, uh, Wobbler of 1924, the Wackett Widgeon uh, of 1925, which was a, a wooden hulled flying boat, the Widgeon II, which was very similar design, but an amphibian. And in that particular aircraft, he flew it on a 9,000 mile journey around the Australian continent in 1928. So obviously a very successful, reliable design at that time. And there's some images, the Warbler up the top, the uh, Widgeon I on the right, the flying boat, and the Widgeon II amphibian on the left down at Point Cook. Uh, he then went on, to uh, develop the Warrigal 1 and Warrigal 2, two seat biplane trainers in 1929 and 1930. And then with the closing down of the experimental section, he moved to the Cockadoo docks and he designed the uh, Kodok in 1934 for uh, Charles Kingford Smith, a uh, twin engine, wooden wing, steel tube frame uh, passenger airliner. Uh, there's the Warrigal 1 on the left, the Warrigal 2, quite a uh, ad advanced design uh, and looking very much like a Westland Wapiti in some ways. And uh, uh, down below the single uh, example of the uh, Kodok that he developed, uh, uh, designed and built for uh, uh, Kingford Smith. Mm. Uh, then his next two designs were his most successful, the Tugan Gannett, which was a development from the Kodok, um, very similar design and construction fabric covered steel tube fuselage with a large single piece wooden monoplane wing. This was the first of his designs to enter series production, series production being basically building one aircraft per order and then building the next one after that in series. And of course, then the Wackett. And the Wackett really isn't known as LW, LJW8, but effectively it's his eighth design. It's a two seat basic trainer, uh, again, steel tube, fabric covered fuselage with a single piece wooden wing. Uh, and this was his only design to enter uh, mass production. Here's the uh, uh, Tugan Gannett. Uh, you can see the very thick uh, single piece wing, which to me is very reminiscent of the, the Wacker trainer. Uh, even the fin and rudder is starting to look a bit uh, like the Wacket on certain angles, but it's a steel tube frame fuselage fabric covered and it's a uh, wing, wooden wing, wooden uh, uh, ribs, spars, and uh, plywood covering. So again, a lot of technology um, similarities to the Wackett. So where does the Wackett come from? In 1936, an air, a, aviation syndicate was formed by Essington Lewis, and Wackett was actually appointed to go on a tour of uh, the UK uh, and overseas looking at aircraft. And they made a proposal that, uh, a factory for the production of aircraft be developed in Australia. And at this time in July 1936, they're already nominating the NA-16, what would become the Wirraway. But they're also nominating the intention to build a small two-seat wooden uh, composite low-wing monoplane for training purposes to a specification prepared for, by the board. And included in this proposal was the intention to purchase the rights to the inline air-cooled engine from de Havilland Aircraft. And this is the major. 
So this is planning to get a gypsy major production rights long before the intention to build Tiger Moss in Australia. Here's the actual uh, uh, syndicate's proposal out of the National Archives. Uh, so what was stimulating some of this was the fact that the British were introducing the Miles uh, mess, uh, Magister into service into the RAF. It's the first monoplane uh, trainer to be approved uh, and inducted into the RAF. It's also a wooden construction, but wooden fuselage and three-piece wooden wing. It has flaps, brakes, dual control, and it's the first low-wing monoplane authorised by the Air Ministry to perform aerobatics. 1,300 built, 700 go into service in to elementary flying training schools in the RAF. Remembering this is all before the beginning of World War II and the uh, EATS program to standardise on Tiger Moths. The monoplane layout was uh, considered important to provide the uh, leading training for the emerging uh, Spitfire and uh, Hurricane monoplane uh, fighters. Here's some pictures of a, a currently flying Magister in uh, England, um, quite a large aircraft, bigger, uh, but similar to the Moth Miner. Uh, and there in the cockpit, you can see the, the wooden uh, structure of the fuselage and a very similar Tiger Moth um, instrument panel and control layout. In October 1937, the Air Board seriously considered this local manufacturer of an elementary trainer. They recognised the emerging prominence of the monoplane, recognised the Miles Magister had a, had a number of modern features that um, earlier trainers didn't have, like the uh, uh, Avro Cadet, in that it had flaps, it had brakes. Obviously, they had dual control. They recognised the fact the Air Ministry were placing a contract in place. However, the syndicate had advised that it wasn't really suitable for local production, and in any case, the licence costs were excessive. Wackett had inspected the Magister in the UK and considered CAC could build or design and build a more suitably local uh, aircraft. However, the Air Board went ahead and purchased a, a Miles Magister, and interestingly, a Gypsy Major Series 2 engine, given the Magister uses the Series 1 engine, and, and more about the Series 2 later, but this was to allow assessment and experience with a monoplane trainer. And here's the actual minutes of that meeting uh, from the archive. So the Air Board then issued a specification 338. And I haven't been able to uh, identify anyone who's got a hard copy or a digital copy of this at this stage. So these are extracts out of uh, Stuart Wilson's book. But the specification that he quotes calls for a single engine, two seat monoplane with general characteristics, including flaps and brakes. Instrumentation to be as fitted to the Magister. Cockpits to be arranged in tandem, but interestingly to be covered with transparent enclosure. Um, so while it is based on the Magister, it is opening the door to enhancements um, beyond uh, the features of the Magister. It, li uh, it um, lists various other features, blind flying hood, rollover protection, uh, ability to perform a range of aerobatics. It must be fitted with the Gypsy Major engine maximum speed not less than 130 miles an hour. And CAC responded to this with a design proposal for a new monoplane trainer in October 38. And they proposed to build two prototypes, used mixed tubular, tubular steel uh, construction with wooden flying surfaces and using a 130 horsepower Gypsy Major Series 2 engine. Now the Series 2 engine is a unique version of the Gypsy Major at that time in that it could uh, it had oil galleries through the uh, propeller shaft to allow a constant speed propeller to be fitted. So in any case, by December 1938, CAC is progressing with a wooden mock-up already under construction and steel fuse, fuselage is being made. But in the meantime, a Magister has been delivered to uh, Australia. Here it is at Point Cook. And lo and behold, on the right, here it is in CAC. And you can see a Wirraway just tucked in behind it. Here's the uh, uh, plan and side view of the Magister and on the right, uh, and this is courtesy of Joe's book, um, the proposal uh, then not named CA2 and certainly not named the Wacker trainer, but you can see the basic structure, the canopies, the steel tube structure inside the fuselage, the inline engine, obviously, unlike the Magister, which has full undercarriage boots and legs, the um, 
proposal was only to ever have some streamlining uh, around the wheels, uh, but very much we're starting to see what would become the Wacker trainer forming up. The other thing that's interesting again to note is that WAC had already had experience with the Kodok and the uh, eight Tugan Gannets that had been built by Tugan um, in building a wooden wing and a steel tube fuselage covered in uh, uh, fabric structure. So he already had a lot of experience in the materials he planned to use in this new monoplane trainer. There's the wing of a Tugan Gannet under construction in Sydney uh, or before uh, this work on the a monoplane trainer had been uh, commenced. And here's a Wacker trainer wing being put together at GMH uh, in the production line of uh, CA6 Wacker. So obviously a lot of lessons learned by Wacker in production of the, uh, uh, the Gannet. He assembled a design team. Uh, I won't go through all the names, but some notable people here, Herb Knight, who joined CAC to be the production engineer, and obviously there was gonna be involved in the production of the future monoplane trainer. Um, he went on to become the general manager when Lawrence Wackett retired. And Fred David, uh, who had, was a, a, a Jewish uh, German uh, citizen who'd worked with Junkers, left Germany as the war clouds formed, went to Japan, worked on the Japanese Val dive bomber, and then saw too that Japan was preparing for war, so he came to Australia. And so he was working on the Wacket before he started work on his more famous involvement with the Boomerang. Uh, here's the, uh, the contract from the Air Board for the supply of the two prototype aircraft. And it calls up a specification A-4, uh, and this is dated uh, uh, 30th of November, 1938, and it refers to this specification A-4. Now, the only, copy of A-4 I've been able to find is with Joe Valor and it was hiding in his ceiling space in a whole stack of research papers that he'd uh, used to uh, write his book from and Joe graciously got up in his uh, roof cavity and dragged it out for me. So I was able to access that for this research. So thank you very much for that, Joe. Here's the, uh, what is becoming the CA2 or the monoplane trainer uh, wooden mock-up at CAC, and here's the first fuselage being welded up. And note that the uh, inline engine mount is, is part of the fuselage structure. It's not a bolt-on structure like Tiger Moths or even the Wacker trainer with the radial engine used. Uh, and so uh, the first aircraft built is uh, uh, A31. It's later renumbered A31000 and one when the, the production Wackets are produced. It's fitted with a Gypsy Major Series 2 and later a constant speed metal propeller. Um, its wing has no letterbox slots fitted. It first flies in September 39. Uh, and uh, a CAC factory report, and I must thank uh, Dennis Baker and also Derek uh, Buckmaster for access to these extracts. But the factory report uh, reports issues with the performance of the aircraft that it's suffering a long takeoff run and having to run the engine at high continuous output, implying it's underpowered. And even some, you know, three or four days after it's flown, there's discussion about using more powerful Gypsy 6 engines, which are available from a gannet that's sitting in the CAC factory. So already we're looking to move away from the uh, Gypsy Major Series 2 engine. Here's the... Uh, uh, first uh, CA2 prototype. There's actually some earlier photos around before this uh, parachute uh, uh, bucket is mounted on the canopy for uh, uh, spin tests. But this is clearly at CAC and it's before it's been handed over to the Air Force, so it hasn't got any A-series markings on it. And this is the Gypsy uh, Major Series 2 engine, identifiable from the, uh, the fitting of the metal prop, the only time any of the CA2 prototypes had a metal prop. Uh, and interestingly here, you can see this aircraft has no wing slots. Uh, it's got a very strange looking tail, which is further forward, which is a feature of the early configurations of the prototypes. And in this space here, the wings clean, and we'll see that changes as we move forward in the, uh, the profile of this particular aircraft. So here it is actually 
now marked as A31. You can just see some markings there. Again, no wing slots. And you can see, again, the de Havilland constant speed prop and the very tight cowling of the, uh, the Gypsy Major. Um, and interestingly here, it bears a lot of resemblance to the post-war chipmunk. Uh, so, you know, CAC was certainly ahead of its time in this design in uh, uh, 1938, 1939. Here's another view of the same aircraft. There's the parachute uh, um, canister for the spin trials. It's certainly now being handed over to the Air Force. Again, no wing slots. All of a sudden, we have a wing generator on the leading edge of this aircraft. And again, you can see the tight cowl of the Gypsy Major. Here's a view inside the cockpit. And this is an image that uh, Joe found uh, from somewhere and sent to me uh, uh, some time ago, unrelated to this, this project. This is a great image. It's very high resolution. You can zoom up into both cockpits. And these cockpits are very similar to the final A uh, CA6 uh, version of the uh, Wacket trainer. So the design is quite well advanced, even though this is a prototype. An interesting aspect, again, some more uh, hereditary technology emerging. On the left is the cockpit of the Tugan Gannet. And here's a Tugan Gannet control column top. And here's a Tugan Gannet control column top in the back seat of a CA2 Wacket. And there's one in the front seat of the CA2 Wacket in that image that we're just looking at. So that the Wacket is not only a new design, but it's bringing along some Australian heritage with the uh, control column from a Tugan Gannet surviving in the CA2. So the, the second prototype, A32, is being fitted with a Gypsy 6 Series 1. Now, the Gypsy 6 Series 1 uh, can only have a wooden fixed pitch propeller, and this, these two engines are available are coming off a Tugan Gannet. The Dragon Rapide has metal uh, props uh, because it uses a Series 2. But in this case, and in all of this early work, there's no consideration of using a Series 2. It's simply a matter of grabbing what they can use. This wing, however, has been fitted with the letterbox wing slots. This comes out of some work done in England on spinning trials um, in wind tunnels and, and uh, calculations of the design. And it first flies on the 8th of November, 1939. A factory report at the beginning of November talks about the A31, the only criticism being it would be better with more horsepower and that the second tra trainer is about to fly and this will allow us to test the, uh, the benefit of the extra power. Here's one of the rare photos of A32, which is not as photogenic or well photographed as A31. So here is A32 at the front door of the hangar, obviously fitted with a Gypsy 6. An A31 has come back into the hangar and had its Gypsy Major removed. They're going to remove the parachute uh, uh, canister. You can see this is A31 because it's got no wing slots. This is again a rare uh, photo of the uh, two uh, prototypes together. Here's another picture of the two prototypes, but now we see both aircraft in their final configurations with the Gypsy 6 fitted to each of them, and each of them have the black. Uh, fixed pitch propeller. So another way again to confirm you're looking at the Gypsy 6 is the, uh, the black uh, fixed pitch propeller. Again, the cowlings are very, very similar. It's really just these uh, air cooling vents that perhaps give it away. So here's a close up of the Gypsy 6 engine cowl. There's venting out the bottom. This is most likely A31 because uh, there's the wind generator. We can't see any evidence of wing slots. And over here on the right hand side is some interesting perforations in the leading edge, which I think must relate to some type of oil cooler fitted to support the, uh, the Gypsy 6 engine. It's not documented anywhere I've seen, uh, but these don't exist on the later uh, production racket. Here's A31 as the Gypsy 6 version with the wooden prop down at Point Cook during its air trials. And here it is flying. Um, uh, above Melbourne. Uh, this is now confirmed to be A31, even though the sensors hidden its identity, a bit of playing around with uh, uh, photo imaging being able to uh, uh, reveal A31 under the wing. So it's certainly again, the first prototype. So if we look at conventional recorded CA2 history, 
we have the first prototype being built and flown with the Gypsy Major Series 2. It's considered to have too long a takeoff run and it's underpowered. And the solution is to fit a Gypsy 6 from a Tugan Gannet. And so the CA2 fitted with the Gypsy 6 uh, is then uh, flown and tested and it's still got a, a long takeoff run and the extra power that the engine has is counteracted by the extra weight. And so it still has this long takeoff run complaint again. And the other conventional uh, story is that the Gypsy 6 was unable to be reliably delivered from the UK. So the solution was to fit an American Warner Scarab. And so the CA2 and the CA6 fitted with the Warner Scarab. Um, the view is the problem was solved, but there's more to this story. Uh, these are some, uh, uh, side view drawings from Derek, uh, and these are fantastic uh, aids. Here's the uh, CA2 with the Gypsy Major. Here it is with the Gypsy 6, and you can see there's not a lot of change in the length and profile. Significant differences in the way the canopies operate on the prototype. The rear canopy slides backwards, and the forward canopy actually has two separate segments that slide back rather than a single double segment. Here's the uh, production wacket. Um, the other change is the tail wheel moves backwards and of course the Warner Scarab fitted. So A32 is flying with the Gypsy 6. However, factory port only a few uh, a week later, perhaps on the 17th of November reports mixed performance. While the performance in the air is greatly improved, the takeoff run is still poor. The additional weight cancels out the additional power. This also results in increase in the stalling speed and the idea will only be achieved by a reduction in weight. And it's suggested this can be done by installing the Warner Scarab and the Air Force requests that that proceed. However, and this is an aspect that's not really picked up in a lot of stories about the racket. There's a further comment in this factory report that raising the rear end of the fuselage relative to the wing may improve takeoff. And as this is relatively easy to do, it's proposed to do it. And so that's a fact that occurs that really isn't picked up in this story, conventional story of the prototype wackets. Here's the actual report uh, out of the archives or by Dennis and uh, Derek. Now, I mentioned the A4 proposal and here's the original A4 proposal that uh, to, to date, the only copy I know of in existence is sitting in Joe's, uh, Joe's uh, ceiling space in his boxes of research papers. And this is uh, dated 11th uh, November uh, 1938 and it states that the wing incidence is to be zero degrees of the route and the washout to be three degrees and the contract to supply the two prototype, prototypes points to this specification as what is meant to be delivered and built and so we're very certain that it was built with an initial zero incidence of the wing. So on the 15th of December a32, the second prototype already fitted with the Gypsy 6, is then reported that the trainer has now been tested and proved entirely satisfactory in regards to the takeoff, which is the only char characteristic was not, which was not up to requirements. And the only things that's happened between the 17th of November and the 15th of December is the change of wing incidence from zero to four and a half degrees. Um, so that's an interesting change which is implied to have had a, a significant effect. Uh, Derek uh, was very skeptical of uh, my views on this, but he's come around, he's not online tonight, but he's shared with me a whole bunch of slides. So I'm just gonna take you through those. This is the original proposal 143 trainer from July 38, and the wing has zero incidents as is expected to be from its specification. Here's the uh, P141 trainer proposal in July 38. You can see the steel tube structure, the wing again, appears to be drawn to have zero incidence. Here's the second prototype under construction. You can tell it's a second prototype as you can see the wing slots here. And there's a very small gap between the lower steel longer on and the top of the wing, which indicates that the rear of the wing is tucked quite up tight to the rear fuselage. Here's uh, the first prototype with the Gypsy Major, and I mentioned to you that there was a photo without the parachute uh, uh, bucket fitted to the canopy. So this is a very early photo of the first prototype, probably at the time of its first flight. 
and uh, you can see the very straight line, the rear fuselage through uh, the back of the wing. Uh, and here's a, a, a drawing of the same uh, setup, but this is now A32 with the Gypsy 6 fitted, still with zero incidents. Here is that first prototype back in the factory, and we saw it from an earlier angle, having its Gypsy 6 fitted, and previously we saw it with the Gypsy 4 removed. The canopy is being modified to remove the boon. There's some work being undertaken on the uh, wing skins for some reason, and the fabric's been taken off the fuselage because if you change the position of the rear fuselage uh, and wing trailing edge, you have to reprofile the fabric uh, uh, join. So they've obviously taken all the fabric off to be able to do that. Here now is the first prototype, A31, but fitted with the Gypsy 6. And now you can see quite a step change in the wing related to the line of the uh, rear fuselage. Um, and so we consider that now you're seeing what we believe is a four and a half degree incidence applied to the prototypes. And so here's a comparison that first, um, likely the first flight of the, of the um, uh, uh, I'm just noticing we've got some labelling problems here. This is actually the Gypsy Major up here, not the Gypsy 6. Uh, and this is actually the Gypsy 6, not the Gypsy Major. So I think there may be some errors in Derek's uh, uh, labelling here. So we'll move on from that. Uh, but here's again the CA6 internal layout in January 1940, still proposing as a CA6 to use the Gypsy 6 engine. And it's interesting, one of the other proposals that I'll show you actually gives both engine options to the rats. So the Gypsy 6 is not totally discounted as suggested. Um, but here now we believe we have the four and a half degree incidence. You can see the, the change in uh, the lower uh, wing profile on the bottom of the two spars. And so on the 20th of June, the Warners finally come from the USA. There's no 165 horsepower Warners available in Australia to temporarily throw in the prototypes, they have to ship two out. And the trials of the trainer with the Warner engine indicate its flying qualities have not been impaired in any way and that the installation is very good. So this is then locking in the choice of the Warner Scarab. Now, Lawrence Wackett's autobiography in 1972 mentions one of the prototypes being fitted with a Gypsy 6, but advises it's not possible to obtain engines of this type as the war intensified. Now the strange thing is CAC had license rights to the Gypsy Major and the Gypsy 6 Series 1 is just a six cylinder version of the Gypsy Major. There's a slightly different crankcase and crankshaft, but the cylinders, barrels, heads, everything else is standard Gypsy Major and wouldn't have been too difficult to get drawings and change that license if they wanted to build the Gypsy 1 Series 1 or indeed build the Series 2. But in any case, Lawrence Wackett doesn't mention this change in incidence, but he does record the Warner Scarabs were being bought from Australia. But again, at this time, he doesn't mention the incidence issue at all. When Stuart Wilson publishes his book in 1994, he is quoting from that same factory report, but he actually omits any reference to changing the position of the trailing edge uh, uh, of the wing to the rear fuselage. Um, so again, it's not really brought out in the story at this point in time. He does point out that the wording of this suggests the decision is to move to the Warner Scarab because of a reduction in weight and nothing to do with the lack of availability of the Gypsy 6 from England. And finally, Brian Hill in 1998 in Wirrawadda Hornet again quotes this same factory report and he does uh, record this commentary about raising the rear end of the fuselage relative to the wing, but there's no closing of the loop as to what that means. And that's a change in the setting of wing incidents in the design. And finally, Keith Meggs in 2020 mentions that same section from the same factory report. He points out that it's not apparent in available drawings and photographs. And he suggests it might have been a change of wing incidents instead. Well, in actual fact, it, it is a change in wing incidents, but he however confuses it with the tail wheel being relocated, which he felt might have had the same required effect. And the tail wheel obviously only has a play on the ground when the aircraft's tail down. Um, so it doesn't have a, a role in this wing incident change. Um, so there's a lot of 
records about the history of the CA2s, but it doesn't really deal with this change in design. So the revised history is that the first Gypsy Major version had zero degree incidence at route. Again, it suffered the tong long uh, takeoff run and under power. It uh, needed to have a Gypsy 6 fitted was the plan. The Gypsy 6 originally flew in A32 without uh, any winning, winning sentence at the route, still apparently suffered a long takeoff run, needed extra power, but the extra weight cancelled out the long takeoff run was of you. Uh, and again, it claims that Gypsy 6 couldn't, was unavailable to be reliable and delivered, so we'll fit a Warner Scarab. But the Gypsy 6 was also modified to have four and a half degree wing incidents and was found to perform satisfactorily. So this change in wing incidence is playing a role. The question is how much. Interestingly, however, certainly by the time the CA6 is being uh, designed, specified and built, it's written up as having four and a half degree incidence compared to the original design proposal of the CA2 being zero incidence. And here we have the supply contract for the 200 wackets. It calls up specification uh, A15. Um, and so A15 actually gets modified later, but here's A15 turned into specification A20 in June 1940. And lo and behold, incidence is recorded here as four and a half degrees, washout still at three degrees. So we, we go into production and the wooden wings are being built at CAC. Initially, the steel tube structures are being built at, uh, uh, sorry, the wooden structures are being built at GMH and the uh, steel fuselages are being assembled at CAC. They're later moved to GMH as well. And CAC simply undertakes the fit out and uh, assembly at uh, their factory. There's a wooden cockpit floor, wing spars, uh, completed wings, tail planes, and, and a wing under construction at GMH. Here's the first production CA6. It's now numbered A31, and the corresponding CA2 has been renumbered A31001. Here's A31 uh, out on the uh, field at uh, Fisherman's Bend, and here's A32 doing an engine run test. Now, the interesting thing is having finally got a contract to build this aircraft after starting the journey in 1936 and commencing construction in 1941, we, we go through the first 80 aircraft getting a production uh, rate of one per four and a half days when they first start up down to one per two days and then Pearl Harbor happens. Japan enters the war, we have war on our doorstep. And all of a sudden this new stopgap fire to the boomerang becomes the priority. There's a little bit of a lag for the first 19 aircraft over the Christmas January period. The factory might have even been reduced workforce at that time and they're back to one aircraft per three days. But the next 100 aircraft are completed at a rate of one per one day compared with the first 100 aircraft being one every three and a half days. So they rushed down the production line to get them out of the way of the uh, pending boomerang production. Here's the early production. There's Moravin's A322, the oldest surviving wacket. Uh, so these are very early production line wackets. Here are the aircraft in the second 100 series. These are being set up as uh, radio trainers for the Wylands and Air Gunnery Schools with the aerial mast. And of course, we're now in wartime two-tone camouflage. Here's the last wacket uh, constructed. A3200, it's got a pennant on the production line. Here it is on the ground at CAC. Here it is over Melbourne. There's uh, Flinders Street Railway Station and the Cathedral and Young and Jackson's and the Yarra. And here it is over Williamstown. This is the Williamstown uh, rifle range in behind it. So the Wacket was originally intended to be a basic pilot trainer, had full, full dual control, able to be flown from either cockpit. It had flaps, blind flying hood, gun camera, practice bomb shackles, so you could even drop bombs. You could even retract the undercarriage, but as a fail safe for learning pilots when you selected it, while the lights went on to show you that the gear was up, the gear firmly stayed down uh, to avoid someone doing a, uh, a gear up landing. It had a constant speed propeller with pick, pitch and mixture controls on the throttle, exactly like the Wurraway and the Boomerang, and in fact, exactly like the P-40, the Mustang and the Thunderbolt. 
So very similar to all uh, World War II uh, single seat fighters of the day. It served largely in this training role with three FDS at Essendon and 11 STS at Benalla, also briefly at Parafield, Narandra, and even at Amberley with uh, three STS. But it quickly got superseded uh, due to the EATS standardization program and the availability of low cost Tiger Moth. So it got pushed out of this basic trainer role because of the small numbers of it, the higher cost to maintain and service, um, but also the, the high need and the high production output of uh, Tiger Moth. Here's um, uh, an air, uh, a pilot with some aircraft at Essendon at uh, three EFTS. Here's the cockpit of the uh, CA6 Wacker trainer. Um, here's the, your uh, throttle pack, identical to Wirraway and Boomerang. Um, here's the control column, which is quite advanced compared to the Wirraway, which is really just a ring grip with two bicycle levers for the uh, twin machine guns on the front cowl. This has electronic, has electric buttons on, sorry, for gun, camera, and for uh, bombs and still a, uh, another lever for the gun to, to reintroduce the lever controls that the we're away and to be fair, the bulldog and the demon before them had had. There's the control column top of the, uh, the wacket. Now, again, in similar ways to what we saw earlier, this is a bit of a uh, family heirloom in CAC because this is actually the control column top from the CA4 wacket bomber. So quite an advanced design developed for the Wacket bomber, being the 04. It's then utilised in the CA6 Wacket trainer. Lo and behold, it's still used in all three models of the Boomerang. So the spade grip in the Boomerang initially was using off-the-shelf Wacket trainer 06 numbered uh, Wacket grips, but the Wacket grip was really based and is identical to the CA4 Wacket bomber uh, grip. The CA11 has a totally different um, uh, control uh, column uh, top or wheel rather than just a, a ring grip. So today's wackets that are surviving in museums have a little bit of CA4 still in them. Here's the back seat of the uh, CA6 wacket trainer, same um, throttle pack, instrument panel, rudder pedals. These are very similar in layout and look to the Wirraway, but everything's shrunk down. There's not a lot that can bolt into a, uh, uh, a wacker trainer from a Wirraway other than things like the throttle pack. Even castings that look the same are fitted on different steel tubes and therefore the casting's been redesigned. Lo and behold, here's that same rear uh, ring grip that we saw in the CA2, uh, which came from the uh, Tugan Gannett. And in fact, when you look up the drawing index and when you look at one of these uh, real life and look at its part number, it's actually an O2 part number. It is a CA2 control column still sitting in the back of Wacket surviving today. So the Wacket trainer then became a wireless or radio trainer. Uh, and this was actually where the Wackets played a very important role. To do this, they had to remove all the dual control and instrumentation from the rear cockpit. They had to install a pre-war R1082 radio receiver and it's matching T1083 radio transmitter. And we had hundreds of these coming to Australia because they'd been ripped out of all of the bomber command aircraft, which is standardized on the then uh, current radio receivers and uh, transmitters. So we had these coming over to us from the UK and we were putting them in trainer aircraft. The rear cockpit also was fitted with a Morse key, a trailing aerial reel to wind out a trailing aerial, a bit like a, uh, a fishing line with sinkers on the end of it. And also it had a fixed overhead aerial strung between the front mast and the rudder. These served with three uh, uh, Wallace Air Gunnery schools, number one at Ballarat, number two at Parks in New South Wales, and number three at Maryborough in Queensland. And they superseded the Douglas DC-2s, Avro Anson DH Dragons that had been used in that role up until the Wacker trainer moved into the role. Here's one of the RAF engineering orders listing the 79 aircraft to be immediately converted to this wireless air gunnery role. Some of these are not yet built at the time that this order is issued. In other words, 200 rolled off the production line already configured. And as we saw in that earlier photo, a number of the later ones in camouflage were being fitted with radio masks on the production line. 
here's the drawing for converting it to a radio trainer. There's the Morse key. Here's the reel for the trailing aerial. Here's the tube that goes down through the floor and through the wing for the uh, trailing aerial. There's the mounting for the front fixed aerial mast. And here's where the wire of the aerial wire comes through the canopy through a glass insulator to connect to the radio system. Here behind this drawing is where the transmitter sits on an angle there. You can see largely sitting on that frame. And there's a receiver sitting up where the rear instrument panel would have normally sat. So this was the drawings that we used to modify aircraft in the field or to configure aircraft at the factory ready for these. The actual radio equipment themselves were fitted out at, at 1AD on new aircraft delivered from CAC. Here's some uh, one wags, uh, wacker trainers at Ballarat. Uh, here's some DC2 still pre performing radio training. These had perhaps five uh, radio stations set up in them uh, where the passenger seats normally would have been. Here's a number of later uh, vintage aircraft all in camouflage now at uh, number two wags at parks. And there's a wonderful color video uh, on YouTube of wackets and other activities at parks. So I haven't put the link to that in this uh, slide presentation, but if you just Google, I'm sure you can find that. Here's a close up of one of those Ballarat aircraft again. This is probably the only photo that really shows the wireless radio installation inside a wacket. There are no internal photos like the CAC manual has of the trainer version. So this is the only photo that shows the radio installation in any form of clarity. And you're looking at the uh, R1082 uh, receiver. Um, and you, again, you see the glass insulator of the lead coming off between the mast and the rudder. And down here, you can see the trailing aerial tube that runs down through the floor and through the wing. That's where the cable will come out if they're using their trailing aerial rather than the fixed band uh, area. There's a changeover switch in the cockpit to allow you to change that over. Here's the remains of A356, um, and the scant remains and probably the only surviving remains of a RAF Wireless Air Gunnery School wacker trainer. There's its aerial mast mounting. That's the front cockpit. Here's the rear cockpit. The seat would be back here. Here's the mounting for the transmitter. Here's the mounting brackets for the receiver. And here's actually a receiver and transmitter sitting in place in the same airframe. That's what the fit out would roughly look like. But unfortunately, there's no wartime photos taken of the inside of the back seat of one of these radio trainers. At the end of the war, the WACA trainers were quickly retired as not seeing having a, a long-term role in uh, peacetime RAF. 117 survived the war and were sold off by the Commonwealth Disposals Commission. 91 of them were purchased by John Brown from Kingston Smith Air Services, and he played a major role in the future of the Wacket from this point onwards. One of the early things he did was sold 49 of those to the Dutch East Indies. Uh, 30 of them were complete and flew with the MLKNIL in the Dutch East Indies, or what is now Indonesia, and the remainder were all converted to component spare parts for those 30. Another eight were converted by Kimford Smith Air Services to what became known as the KS3 Crop Masters. These were wooden winged wackets with Warner scarabs, but with hoppers fitted. So they're the beginning of the journey of the wacket as a successful agricultural aircraft. 21 were later consumed by Kingford Smith Air Services into the manufacture of the Yeoman Crop Masters. A total of 112 registrations were allocated but 66 of those were not taken up and largely 49 of those were allocated to aircraft that JT Brown had purchased, but he then delivered off to uh, the Dutch and he, he relinquished those allocated registrations. However, 46 flew on the Australian register and one of those later flew on the New Zealand register. And so you'll see, I, I put some claims to fame for the Wacket, the first Australian made design to fly on the civil register. Um, in mass production, sorry. The first mass production uh, Australian design to serve with the Foreign Air Force and the first one to go on a civil register overseas. Unfortunately, the last flying wackets uh, ceased flying in Australia in 1968. Here's two of JT Brown's uh, surplus wackets at uh, um, Bankstown. Um, these are 
two radio trainers, A that E95, you know, was sold but never never became a civil aircraft. And you'll see later it gets consumed into the production of the Yeoman Crop Mart. Here is a couple of uh, Dutch Wacker trainers. They flew them in a yellow scheme predominantly with their tricolour markings with a B serial number and flew them without the engine cows because of overheating problems in the tropics. And this same problem was in, uh, often incurred at uh, Maryborough in summer. And so also many of the RAF aircraft of uh, three WAGs also flew without the engine cows. AKF is a uh, Australian civil registered aircraft owned by JT Brown and later used as a trials aircraft for the development of the Cropmaster. Here's the sole wacket that went to uh, New Zealand, ZKAUC, and here's one of the early um, Kingver Smith Air Service crop duster versions. So it's a wacket trainer, a radial scarab, wooden wing still in place, standard wacket tail, but the rear seat has had a hopper put in it and it's flown from the front cockpit and the canopy is then shortened uh, to reflect that change in use. Now, Kingford Smith Air Services with 91 wackets on their hands started to do some experiments. And in 1954, Bill Smith took one of their aircraft, VHAG, AJB, which was already successfully flying on the civil register and did some experimentation. This aircraft kept its wooden wing and its wooden tail plane and its radial Warner Scarab but the wing slots were covered over, the wing tips were removed, and the wing incidents for some reason changed from four and a half degrees back to three degrees, 25 minutes, or 3.42 degrees. And he achieved that by rotating the front castings upside down and swapping them from left to right. Amazingly, this resulted in increased takeoff, increased cruise and climb performance. Here's the aircraft in that configuration. There's no wing slots. There's uh, the uh, round wing tips have been removed. You can't really absolutely confirm what the uh, um, wing uh, incidence is. But again, if you look at the point that uh, Derek had been making, if you follow this straight line through, there's quite a sharp departure of the, the wing uh, uh, lower edge compared to the trailing edge of the fuselage. Here's Morabin's front um, uh, wing spar on their aircraft and you can see the standard forward uh, casting and here is one up the right way and all Bill Smith did was turn it upside down the three or the six mounting holes are symmetrical so you can do it however they've got a camber so when you rotate them you have to swap left to right but you end up with a different position of the fuselage mounting point to the wing which lowers the incidence if you turn it upside down. And that's all he did to achieve this change in wing incidence on A3, uh, sorry, on VHAJB. Now they kept doing developments. They took another wacket, VHAJH, which still survives today at Queensland Air Museum. And they experimented putting a hopper in the cockpit of this aircraft. The KS1 and KS2 versions of which AJH was really the only version to go through that involved putting the hop in the front seat and the pilot sitting in the rear cockpit. And to allow for visibility, they actually had to cut the steel rollover truss off the aircraft. Now, AJH was modified back to a different form called the KS3. And the KS3 put the hopper in the rear cockpit and the wooden wing and the wooden tail plane uh, were retained, the wing slots were retained, and of course the Warner Scarab retained, and a total of five of these aircraft were completed. However, DCA wouldn't approve any more agricultural conversions using the wooden wings or of interest for the wing incidence changes that they'd been developed three years earlier on AJB to be applied to these agricultural aircraft. Here's AJH in its first form with the hopper in the front and the pilot operating in the back seat. Um, here's AJB, uh, sorry, AJH now at the Queensland Air Museum flown from the front and the hopper in the back seat. This is a photo I took when I went up and visited the aircraft many years ago. This is the front left-hand longeron. Here's the rollover truss. And anyone familiar with CAC welding will recognize this is not factory welding. They've actually welded the rollover truss back onto uh, AJH when they moved the uh, pilot back into the front seat. 
which is a surprise to me because I thought they'd just get another steel tube frame from the many fuse, uh, spare fuselages that they had. But this aircraft still has its fuselage bracelet on it and it is still A349 fuselage frame. So they've welded the rollover truss back on after they cut it off. This is the aircraft uh, more recently, uh, Angelo took some photos as did Warwick for me. Interestingly here, the, the mating of the fabric side panel to the wing trailing edge suggests that the wing is, is lower than it should be, which is an interesting uh, aspect. And I asked Angelo to take some photos of the castings in this to see really what's going on. Again, these are the wing castings, these are the front ones. These are orientated up the right way. So there's a big aluminium web below the, the bolting point. And here are the rear uh, castings. And again, there's a big web below the bolting point. So when we look in AJH, its castings are actually up the correct way. So they haven't been rotated as we'd expect them to be like AJB if they'd had a wing incidence change as per AJB. The more interesting thing occurring is in the back. Here's the rear casting and it's actually upside down and that has the effect of lifting the rear spar up, reducing incidence. Be interesting to know what incidence AJH was flying with because this would perhaps reduce it from the standard four and a half degrees to something like the 3.42 or 3.5 degrees that AJB and crop masters had. So in any case, from the, the WAC at K, KS3 crop master, uh, Kingford Smith Air Services form a new company called Yeoman Aviation. Uh, 20 crop masters are built, six are exported. They utilise the Wacker trainer fuselage with minor modifications. They keep the rudder pedals, the instrument panels, the seat, various castings. There's a new metal wing developed using the same airfoil as the Wacker. Wing incidence is changed to three and a half degrees at the, at the root, washout at three degrees. There's a new metal fin rudder and tail plane, new fibreglass fuselage deckings, new windscreen, new canopy. There's a 250 horsepower six cylinder engine put up the front. The first 11 use Lycoming 0540s and the last nine used Continental 0470s. There was some type of financial dispute between Rolls-Royce, the local uh, agent and Yeomans over getting uh, access to further Lycomings. The Yeoman Cropmaster succumbed to the tariff war that also killed off the Victor Air Tourer in, I think, 67. Uh, in this case, however, the Yeoman Cropmaster design, uh, the jigs and even two airframe sets were put in a, a wooden container and shipped off to the USA in the late 1960s. Recently, some parts from those kit sets have uh, surfaced uh, on eBay, and you can buy a set of uh, Yeoman Cropmaster or Wacker Trainer rudder pedals for uh, the pricely sum of about 4,000 US dollars. I, I don't think anyone's purchased them as yet. Here's the Wacker Trainer steel tube frame, and the changes are in two or three places. Firstly, the fuselage is shortened, by removing a length of steel tube because the design of the flying tail in aluminium doesn't need the stern post that the wooden rudder needs. And in the area of the cockpit, two changes occur. The top longerons are doubled up. So here's a Wacker trainer longeron from the rollover truss forward. But on the crop master, the longeron, the, the upper longeron is doubled up to give it extra strength because of the weight and power of the engine that's being fitted. The other change is in relation to the structure under the rollover truss. This is where the rear instrument panel would have normally fitted or in the later radio trainers where the receiver was mounted. Instead, these tubes are cut out and a circular tube is inserted because this is where the hopper sits tucked in under the rollover truss. The wing is an aluminium wing, uh, aerofoil as the wooden wing, uh, similar stations for ribs. It has a... Uh, a split flap in the wooden wacket wing and a full flap um, in the uh, or slotted flap in the yeoman crop master straight wing tips rather than the rounded wing tips they both use the same aileron here's some drawings from uh, uh, derek again the points to spot is a wingspan 37 versus 34 because of the removal of the round wing tips uh, length 27 versus 26 because of the short and steel tube fuse large the wing incidence on the wacket on the wooden wing, four and a half degrees, on the uh, uh, Yeoman Crop Master, three and a half degrees. So that's a learning from Bill Smith's playing around with uh, VHAGB back in 1954. 
wing incidence at the tip is uh, adjusted to maintain the three degree washout. Uh, sweep, leading edge sweep is identical. Uh, there's changes in the wing core due to the change in the design of the flaps, but largely they're the two aircraft, the CA6 wooden wing wacket and the Yeoman Cropmaster. Here's the steel tube structure, again, uh, courtesy of uh, one of Derek's drawings, and you can see this section of steel tube has been cut off. The tail wheel is still mounted in the same place, but the design of the fin rudder no longer needs a stern post that runs up the back of the wooden fin. Here's the Yeoman Cropmaster factory at Bankstown, wall full of wacker trainer spares, his A395 dragged into the hangar, ready to be pulled apart to become something spare parts for crop masters. Here's a crop master leading edge. Here's another wacker trainer fuselage. Here's a wacker trainer wooden wing, wacker trainer fuselage frames. And so this is the conversion process of wackets into crop masters. Here's a crop master being manufactured in the hangar. Uh, you can see the cowling here. No wing slots in uh, yeoman crop masters. I might have called it a wacker trainer earlier. Interestingly, here's the, the front cockpit of a Yeoman Cropmaster, standard wacker trainer instrument panel with different instrument fit out, uh, magneto key, ignition key in the center, which is normally separate switch. And lo and behold, here's a CA2 control column grip sitting in the Yeoman Cropmaster, reminiscent or really heirloom from the Tugan Gannett uh, cockpit. So it lives on even in the, the Yeoman Cropmaster. Here's a Cropmaster taken from the side, very hard to really pick that this is a wacker trainer. Wheels and tyres are similar, tail wheels different in this particular case. Metal wing, metal uh, fin and rudder, total different tail plane, clad fuselage with extensive fiberglass, obviously the horizontal six uh, cylinder horizontally opposed engine. Today, there are four complete examples of wackets in museums. A322, the oldest survivor is being restored at Moorabbin. It is complete, but it's going through a deep restoration. A349 uniquely is a KS3 agricultural wacker trainer, but still very much a wacker trainer at Queensland Air Museum. Over at Bull Creek, AIY is um, Horry Miller's private aircraft in his civil markings. A and in uh, Darwin, uh, sorry, in Alice Springs, a very sad VHBEC, which was uh, uh, flown by, I think, Julian Knight. I might be getting his name wrong and muddling him up with someone else, actually, now I think of it. But he flew out of Adelaide to fly to Perth and he flew straight over the transcontinental railway line, didn't spot it. That was his intention to navigate via it. And he just flew north into the desert and became lost, uh, did a forced landing and perished uh, in the desert. There's a composite static restoration underway at Maryborough using Sid Beck's fuselage from AJY, and that's progressing quite well. And there are three long-term airworthy restoration projects, A385, A3129, and A3167. Yeoman Cropmasters, there's one complete example in the museum, which is John Gallagher's restored example of the prototype or first production example, CXS in the Powerhouse Museum or now in storage. Moorabbin Air Museum have VHAGL in storage for a future static restoration. There are two under restoration to fly, FBC here in Australia at Wagga and CTX, which is uh, about to fly in New Zealand. And the only one currently flying, which had been registered and flying in New Zealand as ZK CPW jumped the ditch um, uh, just over the, the, the last six months and has been re-registered and on the Australian register now as YPQ based at Warwick in Queensland. So hopefully we'll see that at some air shows and fly-ins over time. Here's the Moorabbin example. It's going to go back into your yellow scheme, I believe, when it's uh, finished in its current registration. Horry Miller's aircraft at Bull Creek in Western Australia. Queensland Air Museum's KS3, AJH, and uh, BEC or A3139 uh, uh, that got lost in the desert now at uh, the uh, Alice Springs Museum. And here's YPQ, the flying uh, Cropmaster, this is actually on Lord Howe Island, halfway across its trip from uh, New Zealand to Australia, taken by the, the pilot who flew it across. So one of the things that Peter's request of me to do this uh, presentation cause was for me to drill down into this whole area of wing incidents, starting with AJB and, and going backwards as to what was going on with wing incidents. And so I 
enlisted the assistance of my brother, David, who's a, a aeronautical engineer, aerodynamicist, worked on the Nomad, uh, the Wamara project uh, as, uh, in America as the chief pilot, chief engineer for, and I'm not gonna remember the, the company name off the top of my head, but it effectively the Pitts Special Company. Um, uh, so he's flying his, uh, his uh, favorite job of flying around in Pitts Specials uh, and paid to do it in America. So he's done for me an initial analysis of the CA2, CA6 design configurations. Unfortunately, the available data is vague and contrary. He's developed a simple drag model comprising of a profile drag coefficient at zero lift uh, with, uh, and I can't see the words here because I've got people's faces over the top, so don't mind me, but he used uh, uh, drag dependent calculations. But there's still in insufficient data points for a more comprehensive model but he did some comparisons of the glide ratio and the rate of recline versus air speeds. And his drag model is giving in the correct form a glide speed and speeds for maximum rate of climb that match the operating manual published by CAC. So he has some confidence in the model that he's developed. Um, here's some results, some initial results. This is very early. Some of this has only been done in the last few days. But this model's A31 with the gypsy major and the gypsy major is seen with this orange and this blue line. The blue line is the engine horsepower and the orange line is the drag horsepower. This is horsepower versus uh, cruising speed. Where they cross over is effectively the efficient maximum speed. These other two lines are A32 with the gypsy six and A31 fitted with the gypsy six, but the green line represents a31 with the change of wing incidence, but it also always has no wing slots. And so David explains to me that the gap between the two is really reflecting more the change in drag. And it's hard to explain whether the drag is more affected by the lack of wing slots than the wing incidence. And these two horizontal lines represent the Gypsy 6 engine horsepower versus the uh, Warner Scarab horsepower. So again, you get different intersects of those lines. But David's opinion is that the long takeoff run of the uh, uh, Gypsy Major, which was reported as poor performance, may all be due to the propeller selected. Uh, it did some early flights with a fixed pitch propeller and later a ground selectable two position propeller. But even when it had the constant seed prop, it had no manifold pressure gauge to maximize the efficiency of the constant seed prop setting. And in that case, you may not be getting anything like 100% of the engine power. And so this may not relate to the rated power of the engine or the zero wing incidents. And with uh, A32 with its Gypsy 6, the long takeoff run is also more likely to be due to the fixed pitch propeller that the Series 1 engine is forced to use rather than the difference in engine weight or its wing incidents. And the wing incidents will impact more on the speed more than on the takeoff run, is, is his summary there. With the CA6, there's far more uh, usable data. And here we're comparing the standard CA6 production wacket with AJB, uh, the modified wacket, which had its wing slots covered over and the wing incidence dropped from four and a half degrees to 3.42. And the gap between these two lines is effectively the difference reduction in the drag between the modified wacket and the standard wacket. Again, we're not sure whether it's related to the wing incidence change or whether it's related to the fact that the wing slots have been removed. And certainly David's opinion is the wing slots are not necessary. The washout in the basic design achieves the same result or with less drag in any case. So that's the end of my pre presentation. I'm sorry if I've run over a little bit. Um, there was a lot in it. Um, I'm happy to take questions. I think I've hopefully pointed out the significance of the aircraft against the dot points that are on the page there. Uh, so I'm happy enough to open up for, for any questions. I know that uh, people will want to get going. So I'll let uh, Peter and uh, Warwick dictate how many questions I can take. Thanks very much. Um, Will, uh, is there any questions in the room? Yes, the question at the back here. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much for your talk. Um, question about the parachute bucket or canister. What, what was the purpose of it? You mentioned that it was used for spin training. Well, it, you know, spin trials, remembering this is a prototype aircraft. You've got a test pilot who's risking his life in an unproven aircraft. And the wind yield suffered a problem of not being able to 
go into a spin and needed the tail modified to make it spin better. Some other aircraft, and Harry Hawke is a good example of someone who suffered this, early aircraft could enter a spin and, and perhaps more not the experience of pilots to know how to get out of spins. But if you're in an aircraft that won't recover from a spin, there's not much choice. Uh, you either get out with a parachute or in this case, you have the aircraft use a parachute. So there's a canister on the back canopy. There's a strong cable tied to the steel tube frame. Uh, and you obviously could release the canister while you're spiraling down and that would break the dive of the aircraft. It would probably break the canopy as well because there'd be a steel cable that would just rip through the, the aluminium structure between the parachute and the, um, and the steel tube frame. And I assume you'd then idle off and somehow just let the aircraft slowly sink to the ground, but you would be alive. But that was a design of test aircraft for a period of time. Thanks, Mark. And can I ask a question? Can you, well, it's not so much a question. Well, I guess it is a question. Can you um, tell us a little bit about, I believe you've got a Wacket project yourself. So yes, I, I have a Wacket trainer project. I've had it um, since last century. Um, I started collecting aircraft in my teens and I got Wirraway parts. And I collected my first Wacket trainer parts from Tokenwall in the mid seventies. I gave them to a guy called Richard Head who was working with uh, 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 Malcolm Long and produced a, a static Wacker trainer fuselage. Uh, but I then purchased a, uh, um, a derelict crop master from John Gallagher and I swapped it to Moorabbin for a very derelict spare Wacker trainer fuselage they had from A3167 or VHAGP. And I've been collecting parts ever since. In the mid eighties, I purchased a, about 4,000 paper drawings from CAC before the company closed. So I have release note, uh, wing drawings and the intention was to build a wooden wing. Uh, I've since collected many other parts, but I've purchased crop master wings and I plan to fly with a metal crop master wing. The metal crop master wing has a uh, wing incidence of three and a half degrees. It's 200 pounds lighter than wooden wing. It's already built and sitting in my possession. Uh, and it's, so it should give an improved performance, not unlike the AJB uh, evidenced against the standard wacket. So I have no concern about using the metal wing. And this is no different to uh, uh, Bill Reed with uh, Terry Brains Anson in New Zealand. Uh, has a metal wing rather than a wooden wing, but it still flies. And that's really the focus of a flying aircraft, not to necessarily be perfectly accurate and authentic. There are always compromises in engines, radios, brake systems uh, that you have to take into account for a flying aircraft. Thank you. Any more questions here? Any more questions from the Zoom land? Joe Gollum? You're on. Yes, Joe. Oh, congratulations for the presentation. I mean, our, our talks together come out, come out very good with the way you presented it. It's all there. It's funny, Joe. I, I helped Joe out in the 80s or early 90s with some of my research papers. And uh, some 30 years later, when Joe's getting stuff out of his uh, ceiling, uh, um, storage area, I'm finding photocopies of my stuff with my handwriting on it that I gave mm -hmm. to Joe. So the debt's been repaid with Joe giving me access to some very unique early CA2, uh, CAC design proposals, which have been the basis of the research I've done for this presentation. So thanks to Joe for giving me access to very hard to find documents. And, and it's a lesson because I didn't read those, those two specs in detail when I got them. I just thought, Oh, they're there, and that was it. Until you aroused the, the discussion of the of the conflicts, and certainly listened to me anyway. <laughs> Every yes, like listen to me. Yes, and and this information was hiding in plain sight in in um, Keith's book that was published recently in 2020, and also Brian Hill's book. But the significance or what it was really telling us wasn't understood or recorded, and that's why I've gone to a lot of trouble to include it in this recorded presentation and PowerPoint. Uh, I'll probably try and allocate some time to write a HSA journal covering the same material on, on the CA2, but I just felt this presentation shouldn't be a, a standard, this is a Wacket, this is a Yeoman crop master, this is how many were built type story that most of you probably already know anyway. Yeah, well done, well done. Well done. Yeah. 
and again, this has been a, an evidence of the, the amateur historian researchers in the AHSA helping each other. I've been online international archives, but I've got folders that I copied stuff uh, for Joe in the 90s related to face-to-face -face visits to the uh, archives in those days at Brighton. So mm -hmm. this, is, this is really what the AHSA is here to do, to do research and present it for the common knowledge of this. There is my book there for, for the partaking of. <laughs> yes, and, and certainly it has, it's uh, referenced in, uh, in my presentation, and I thank Joe for not only giving me access to his research material, but for publishing yet another wonderful uh, document on the CAC uh, uh, factory. And it's uh, more importantly, it's, it's unique designs rather than just the mass production aircraft we're familiar with. It's the aircraft they designed and perhaps didn't build or the ones that they did one-offs like the Wackett uh, Bomber and the Woomera, very advanced types, perhaps over, um, overextended at the time, but even with the Wackett, with the innovations of the pretend retractable undercarriage, was a very clever innovation to be putting in in Australia in the, the 1930s, which wasn't really, to my knowledge, replicated in any other uh, basic trainer on the design or emerging uh, elsewhere in Europe or America. Thanks, Joe, too. Um, you mentioned quite a few times in your talk about the slots or the lack thereof in the wings. These slots were out toward the wing tips. And for those not quite sure what this is all about, it's just that when the aircraft gets back to the stall, you want the wing to stall inboard first, not at the tips. Is that correct? That, that's right. And, and Handley Page had developed wing slats and wing slots in the, the 30s and put a patent on them, was promoting them. I'm not saying purely for profit, but promoting what he thought was the engineering benefits. And so we saw the Lockheed Hudson have wing slots. And so we saw the second prototype and all 200 production wackets all have wing slots. Um, and these were wing slots were supported in the recommendations of the monoplane trainer testing that was done for CAC in England before uh, uh, the uh, Wacket was actually built. But it seems from David's experience and work that the wing washout largely negates the need for these in terms of stabilizing the stall. And in fact, they contribute more drag than benefit. And we see that with the performance of AJB in 1954, when they cover over the wing slots, you actually get a better, faster aircraft, higher speed, um, and claim to be higher climb rate uh, without the wing slots. But also, we, again, we have that change in wing incidence. Um, and of course, the crop master deletes the wing slots as well. So while there are uh, a strategy in the 1930s, they seem not to be supported ongoing, and there are other ways to solve the the, the performance of the aircraft going into store without putting these drag inducing slots in the leading edge of the wing. So they've fallen out of favor. And of course, we don't see many aircraft at all with the letterbox wing slots. Of course, there are plenty of other devices on the front end and trailing end and the, uh, the rails that are on uh, airliners. So there are still various other technologies added to wings to control their performance. But these letterbox yes. slots seem to have fallen. For example, the chipmunk, the chipmunk's got little stall strips inboard to make it uh, stall there. For, on the other end, uh, I owned a Stinson L5 for nearly 10 years, and they got very big slots, take about a third of the wing span from each tip. Yeah, That's right. Anyway. And even the Wirraway had a very bad um, wing stall, you know, which actually resulted in a, in a restored Wirraway crashing at Nowra some years ago. Uh, so I was known for very vicious wing stall characteristics, and that's why the wing on the T6 Texan is actually a, a different wing to the Wirraway. Uh, but part of the attempt to change that wing characteristic was to put little wedges on the very front of the leading edge of the wing on the wing centre section. They're very hard to spot, but obviously they were considered to have some aerodynamic performance benefit, uh, and they're actually a required fitting still on flying Wirraways today. Now, I think, uh, Phil... Weber had a question, Bill. Um, <clears throat> all right, it's Phil Barbara here. Um, I will ask a question if that's all right. Um, first thing to say is uh, what a great bit of research, Mark. It's um, really uh, impressive what you've put together there. And uh, it's always good to see some myths being knocked on the head. Well, I have to say, if Peter hadn't asked me to, to do this 
presentation or if it had gone ahead in February, March, when it was originally planned, you would have just got the textbook, here's a whacket, this is what they looked like, this is what they did. Um, so it was really the extra time and also doing some work on preparing um, the engineering of using the crop master wing caused me to drill in to the wing incidence issue. Because again, the wing incidence is different on the crop master to the whacket and you ask yourself why. I wish that Bill Smith was around to explain what made him wake up one day and decide to swap the castings upside down on VHAJB. And I think there must have been some knowledge in the industry that the wing incidence on the production wackets perhaps was a bit too uh, steep. And David has the view that maybe the four and a half degrees was developed around the Gypsy Major once they were starting to fly it and they didn't then reassess it for the power setting of the Warner Scarab. But in any case, as we know, the wacket quickly fell by the wayside in CAC's workload. They didn't have time to keep refining the design. They moved on to more important things, which you know, were needed in our war effort. Um, you would expect, I think, that the incidents would be around about three degrees on a you know your normal sort of lightish aircraft, which the wacket really is. Yes. Um, so four and a half sky high. But what seems really weird is that they chose zero initially, which um, with the washout would mean minus three at the wingtips, which is a bizarre thought. Yes, and, um, and, yes, and, and it's clear from when you read the flight reports, the factory reports, that they do change the incidence and the contract with the RAF clearly says you must build it to your specification A4 and A4 absolutely specifies zero wing incidence. So they certainly built the first two with zero initially. Um, so my question, Mark, uh, and maybe uh, David might be the right person to answer this because uh, he's got a lot of practical experience, but um, the covering over of the slots, would that significantly affect the spinning characteristics of the aircraft? Oh, okay. David's popped an answer into chat there. So is that more spin resistance with the slots or without them, David? Yeah, more spin resistance uh, with the slots, Phil, that would be my guess. Yeah, well, that's why we thought they would have put them there in the first place rather than, or you know, maybe handling around the stall anyway. So it, um, that kind of raises the question mark then of um, how that translated into certification of aircraft like the Cropmaster with no slots. Well, DCA actually approved, there's a full report in National Archives on AGB IGB is actually given type certificate with the 3.42 degrees and no wing slots. So that's actually documented. Uh, Do and that you know then, if it was spun? There are spinning tests in the reports from, AJ, from Kingford Smith Air Services. Um, there's some C of G issues for some reason that then causes them to retract the initial approval for this same um, wing incidents to be applied to the KS3s. So there's letters that try and rescind the notice. And it's interesting that AJH seems to have a wing incidence change built into it, but by the rear castings rather than the front castings. Now, whether that's just haphazard of its various assemblies and disassemblies, but it's just strange that the rear casting is upside down. Um, the other question uh, Roderick's asked is, what is the payload of the crop master? I haven't got that figure in front of me, Stuart. Wilson's uh, record probably has it. Um, but, you know, yes, it, it can carry a lot more. You can see it because it's got a 250 horsepower engine. There's more lift because the metal wing, um, you know, with the three and a half uh, degree incidence is claimed to have better uh, flying performances. And there's 200 um, pounds of less weight in the metal wing than in the wooden wing anyway. So the metal yeoman crop master has 200 pounds extra capacity because of the lightness of the metal wing, um, but it's got 200, uh, I think it's 250 horsepower, sorry, uh, uh, engine. And that's the reason for lifting that extra weight that the front uh, longerons have been doubled up with uh, another uh, steel tube, uh, 4130 steel tube welded next to the existing wacket uh, uh, longerons. So yeah, yes, I, I can't give you the payload off the top of my head, Roderick, but 
you'd expect it to have significant extra carrying capacity compared to the KS3 that uh, exists at uh, Queensland. Thanks for that. Thank you very much. I guess the real limitation is the size of the hopper that you can fit into the back seat of the Wacket Yeoman Crop Master anyway. Um, and of course, we, we had gone the other way with the series of a massive aircraft and hopper. And it seems from the Pawnee and other things that the, the issue is to have the right size hopper and to be able to do quick re reloads and more, more flights rather than carrying a massive load to begin with. Because you want that maneuverability up and down the crops and around the power lines and the trees in any case. So you don't want it to be too heavy. You want it still to be fairly nimble aircraft, I suspect. Okay, thanks. If there's no more questions, I think we'll wind up the main part of the evening. And thank you once again for a very good talk on the Wacket and its variants. Thanks very much. No worries. Thanks, Warwick. Uh, thanks, Peter, for the opportunity. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I, I hope uh, you enjoyed that. Keep safe, everyone.